I've got a few presentations that deal with uh, PC partitioning, with file systems, with the way the DFC program works. Presentations are updated a little bit. Uh, most of the information is, uh, is a couple of years old. On the other hand, uh, PC partitioning and, uh, and HPFS haven't changed all that much the last couple of years, so uh, it's probably still pretty good. Uh, there's another session tomorrow where I'll uh, talk some more about the latest features in the, the DFC program and also uh, do some live demoing of stuff uh, like file browsing, like the bootable uh, USB <coughs> stick that runs the UC. During those presentations, if there are any questions, just pop them up. Uh, otherwise, if I'll just keep talking, you'll probably fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, so if anything you'd like to know, please ask, and we'll just dig into it. Uh, I had the other laptop prepared for demoing, more or less, uh, but there's also several DFC versions running on uh, this one. Uh, this, uh, this ThinkPad is running Windows 10, uh, and it has uh, Arc OS in first room scene, and it has, a uh, I think it even has a uh, Mac OS in the first of the scene and uh, another Windows, I think. So there's lots of DFC versions we could take a look at. Um, I'll start with uh, partitioning. Um, DFC is, is a disk management kind of program, and one of the important things uh, of using disk is, is uh, managing space on them, using separate areas where you can put stuff usually called partitions. Uh, you, you can put <coughs> information on them without any partition, uh, like you used to do in the old days on a floppy disk or whatever. It's called single volume or, or unpartitioned uh, disks. But usually you'll have a hard disk and have at least a single partition on it, which will contain a file system like a file, file system or ISP, FS, JMS, whatever. Um, and on, uh, on classic computers, uh, the IBM PC and, and whatever came after that, it's usually uh, called the MBR partitioning, uh, which is uh, the old way of uh, partitioning hard disks uh, still being used. Uh, and for OS2, at a certain point, uh, some added functionality was uh, built into uh, LVM, logical volume management will sort of add on to the MBR partitioning scheme, adding extra information like uh, partition and volume names, drive letters, and stuff like that. Uh, and more recently, the GPT partitioning <coughs> scheme uh, is becoming popular because it's uh, breaking some of the limitations of the MBR partitioning scheme and uh, make it much easier to have more partitions uh, and more importantly, make it easier to have very large partitions and very large disks because the MBR partitioning scheme is limited to 32-bit uh, sector numbers which means that uh, the largest partitions you can create using regular 512-byte uh, sectors uh, is uh, 2 terabytes and, uh, the disks these days go up to 4, 6, 8 terabyte easily uh, so that's possible to use those disks uh, entirely uh, using the uh, MBR participant scheme. Um, GPT is used by default these days on uh, modern Windows systems, by Mac OS, uh, lots of stuff. As soon as you want to use disk over 2 terabytes, you put more or less uh, got to stick to GPT. Okay, this is what I'll be talking about in this session. I think this was covered in the introduction already, software engineering scene. Did a little bit in, in the other languages mentioned, but my primary development language is uh, plain uh, C. I did a lot, a lot of software engineering and also system management and those two stuff 
as, as a consultant. Uh, but in 2001, uh, I was trying to take a sabbatical, which wasn't possible at the company where I was, so I had to quit. And I told them, okay, I'll just quit and then go back six months later, but that never happened. <laughs> uh, I started, after a couple of months, uh, I started uh, my own company and worked on, on the DFC utility uh, that actually started its life as a DHPFS, I think it was called, Display HPFS. It was in the early 90s, the HPFS file system came along with OS2. Uh, and for me that was very frustrating in the sense that before that I already did this recovery stuff and I thought, Courses uh, about the covering stuff from file file systems, stuff like that, using not utilities, the disk editor, stuff like that. And then HPFS came along and <coughs> you sort of went blind because everything was unknown and uh, there were no utilities, no tools. Uh, and I was uh, lucky enough to, uh, uh, to be a uh, presentation by uh, the designer or the implementator of HPFS for OS2. So I got, a, got to know a lot of the internals about HPFS and uh, based on that I developed the utility to display uh, basic structures and that. And that's how DFC actually started, as, as a tool to display and, and manipulate and whatever, uh, the HPFS file system. Uh, over the years I've built it out to also uh, do things uh, like, like FAT and NTFS and positioning and so, whatever. DFC became after that. Okay, then back to partitioning. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons for partitioning. Uh, some people like to put everything in separate partitions just because they also probably like to have everything in separate closets as well, but I don't. But there are there are a few uh, advantages of doing that, like uh, keeping your operating systems on different partitions from your applications, and from, uh, especially from your data. Applications is less important, I guess, but at least for your data. Because then it, it's a lot easier to use the same data with multiple operating systems, or to upgrade your operating system without affecting your data or your applications. Although with applications it's a bit of a problem. OS2 is, is pretty good in it, but if you have uh, a Windows installation, for instance, then Installed applications will not just be <coughs> on disk, there will also be lots of information in the registry and lots of other places, so it's usually pretty hard to have, have a second Windows installation use the same applications without reinstalling or at least reconfiguring or whatever. So I usually tend to put operating systems and applications in a partition and then data stuff somewhere else in one or more data partitions. Um, also, if you have multiple partitions, you're, you're going to have multiple drive letters as long as you're using <coughs> an operating system that uses that, like Windows or OS2. Uh, then, in the old days, uh, because the FAT file system was limited to uh, very small sizes, was it 2 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes, something like that, 2 gigabytes. The hard drives quickly became larger than that, so you used to have uh, maybe 10 or 12 partitions just to be able to use your complete disk. But since FAT32 and HPFS and JFS, it's no longer the case. Although HPFS is still limited to 64 gigabytes. Uh, then another reason for partitioning is to use multiple operating systems. I used to run uh, uh, PCs or, or desktop systems with uh, three or four operating systems loaded. Uh, used <coughs> uh, two different OS2 systems, the main system and then the recovery one, the maintenance one. Uh, <coughs> often a Windows and a Linux. And so you could uh, boot either one of those and they could also share uh, the same data partitions if you configured it uh, to work that way. So things like FAT file systems could be accessed by all of those uh, multi-boot. Uh, last couple of years I don't really use it anymore because I use virtual machines more than multi-boot. I usually have a single base operating system on the, on the laptop and then anything else that's needed is going to run in the virtual machine. Because the advantage of 
through some diseases that they run simultaneously and it's not good it's either one or the other uh, to reboot if you want to use the other uh, operating systems. Uh, well, the, the final part is uh, lots of operating systems actually require uh, hard disks to be partitioned. They will not, not always even recognize or at least not work properly if, uh, if there's no partition defined. If, even if the partition is the whole disk, you still need that little bit of information in the MBR and stuff. Decided to, to be able to use it properly. Is there any questions? Just shout them out. Uh, okay, so PC systems up in, until uh, most modern stuff, you can still use uh, NBR partitions. The NBR stands for Master Boot Record, and it's the very first sector on any hard disk. It's an important one because it will contain some code that is being called by uh, starting up your system by the BIOS. It will uh, load the code that's in, in that first uh, sector and from there everything else will continue. So it will either go on with uh, uh, interpreting the MBR table so that, that actually uh, describe the partitions that are on the disk. Or it might do something else entirely. It could be a bootloader in there with additional sectors being loaded. Whatever. Uh, the, the standard MBR contents will be a small uh, piece of code that interprets the partition tables. There's, there's space for, to define four partitions in there. And it will, uh, the normal behavior of that boot code is that it will uh, try to find one that is uh, called the active partition and has a flag set uh, that that is a partition to be booted. At least that. And as an alternative, if you install things like IBM Boot Manager or Airboot, uh, there's probably additional code that will load the rest of that uh, Boot Manager into memory and that will do its thing with whatever information that uh, it has available. A question. I yeah. guess with Airboot yeah. and multiple partitions, mm -hmm. does it behave pretty well if you had Windows and Linux and OS2? It could control all of them for the multi -boot? Yeah. I'm not really an expert in Airboot, but what Airboot is doing is uh, it takes up the first track more or less of the, of the hard disk. It has uh, code there that, that implements all of its functionality and it also has several sectors there of configuration info. And that's sort of duplicating and, and, and uh, complementing the information in the MBR. So it will boot up, it will analyze partitions and see what's there and it will present you with a menu and you can Configure it like okay, those are those are bootable, those are data, so they will take them out of the list and stuff like that. And it will write that back in, in its configuration settings. And as long as that is uh, uh, kept intact, Airboot will function properly. So it should coexist with a pesky Windows and OS2 all together. Uh, usually, yeah, but as I said, I'm not really an expert in Airboot, okay. but there, there yeah. can be complications. No problem, no problem, no problem. Like, uh, if you're also booting uh, Linux, uh, for instance, you might have problems at Airboot not properly uh, cooperating with the, uh, the Linux uh, boot managers. So, lots of things are possible, but there are also lots of possible ways to do things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> That's one of the reasons why it's often on modern hardware, where you've got enough power, it's probably easier to use virtual machines than it is to have multiple boot <coughs> systems. And, uh, less complications because most of the operating systems, Windows uh, always has been that way, but Linux is also going uh, in that direction, is that they really try to uh, grab the whole machine uh, for themselves, not, uh, not taking <coughs> other operating systems into consideration. Like the newer grubs, uh, they're, very, well, they're more difficult to, uh, to make, co make them cooperate well with other operating systems than um, okay, I said there's a, in that MBR sector there's a space to define four partitions. And because it was very quickly uh, apparent that four partitions was a, a limitation, 
there was another scheme developed to allow one of those petitions to be subdivided in even more called logical petitions. So that, that's how uh, the NDR petition scheme uh, allows uh, more than those four. Um, but there are also other alternatives. Uh, the most important one is the GPT one, so GUID based uh, petition tables, which is often, uh, often combined with the UEFI systems, uh, where using GPT is more or less uh, mandatory. It is possible to run a UEFI system on MBR, but it's not common. Uh, and the, in the old days, Windows already used GPT type partitioning, but it was called something uh, like dynamic disk or something. But it basically, it was the same, same structure. And the Mac has been using it for several years. Um, then there are a few others, like uh, Macintosh used to have uh, another partitioning scheme that uh, looked a little bit like uh, GPT, but different. Uh, and of course, Unix and mainframes have all their ways subdividing disk space, slices or whatever. But they're not important for the PC. Okay, I've already mentioned some of this, I think. Master boot record. Uh, that's how it will start up the system from the BIOS. Once it is booting, it will uh, find the active partition, and from that it will go to the first sector of that partition, called the boot record, partition boot record. And that's another piece of code, uh, which, will, which knows it, it's being installed or written when installing the operating system, and it knows how to start and load that operating system. So that's, uh, I think what they also talked about, uh, it usually has a, a micro file system attached that knows how to find OS2 boot, for instance, if, if it's about OS2. Uh, and OS2 boot contains a mini file system that knows how to find the base drivers. And once you've got the base drivers in IFS, uh, the full uh, file system functionality is available and you can get to anything inside the uh, PC. Oh, this is another uh, interesting point. The last point, the BIOS and the operating system may see disk ordering differently. Uh, that's because uh, this can be attached in many ways. It could be USB, it could be SCSI, it could be ATA or uh, whatever. Uh, and the way those disks are ordered or, or enumerated during boot uh, or, or being displayed by the BIOS can be different than the order that's being seen by the operating system. And that can also depend, for instance, on the, on the, the order that you put device drivers into your config on sys. If you swap things around, <coughs> you may see the disks in a different order. Uh, and that sometimes means that if you've got two disks, that the BIOS sees disk uh, 1 versus disk 2 different from uh, uh, OS 2, or Windows, or whatever. So be aware if you do things like cloning, Look carefully before starting, <laughs> because you might clone to the wrong disk. Okay, this is a small example of how it might look, look like. <coughs> so what you see here is a disk with some free space at the end. <coughs> and there's uh, actually three partitions defined, two primaries, as they're called. So the, the file system is directly in the partition. And the third one is uh, subdivided in, in three more logical partitions. And this is just what the table looks like. It's very simple, uh, it just has a few flags and it has a, a starting and an ending uh, sector or a size of the case for entries. This is in each of the entries. There's a flag to see if it's uh, active. And normally there should be only one active partition. Uh, and actually all the biases would, would actually uh, uh, hang or throw an error if there were more than one. 
there's some information in there about the start and ending locations, and it's in, in two different formats. One is called CHS, Cylinder Head and Sector, which is a very old way of describing uh, positions on a disc in, in, in actual disc cylinders and, and head positions and sectors and stuff like that. Uh, and the other one is uh, LBA, logical block addressing, which actually says, okay, on this <coughs> disk it is uh, block number uh, 273 or something. And then inside the disk, uh, calculations will be done to find out exactly where that sector is. And in practice, uh, almost all uh, software is using LBA kind of addressing. Uh, but because of a lot of legacy code in, in viruses and even in OS2 kernel and stuff like that, OS2 kernel internally works with CSS addressing, uh, which makes it a little bit complicated sometimes. Uh, although the disks themselves don't really use it, uh, you still see it. And there's still some uh, things you have to consider in placing partitions and stuff like that because there, there's, uh, there are some rules. Uh, where to put partitions always on, on the first sector of, of a track, stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, so the CSS values are of some importance uh, because of type of compatibility and, and lots of checks that are in the software to make sure those rules are obeyed even if they're not really relevant anymore. They haven't been relevant for about 20 years. It's still in there. I think I mentioned most of that, maximum of four entries. Partitions could be hidden. Uh, partitions have a type, like uh, FAT file systems have type 4 or 6, and uh, uh, installable file systems like HPFS have type 7. Uh, and if you add uh, 10 to that, hexadecimal is, <laughs> uh, type 17 will be a hidden HPFS or a hidden installable file system. And the type 16 will be a hidden FAT. It's not used very much anymore. But that way you could hide data partitions or bootable partitions. Uh, and usually the buyers will only boot uh, primary partitions. So if you want to boot an operating system from the logical partition, which is also possible, you're going to need uh, either a very smart BIOS or uh, usually uh, a boot manager, like Grub or like Airboot or uh, IBM boot manager. subdividing works to create logical partitions is that the, uh, the first sector in each uh, in, in the logical partition is another NBR-like uh, uh, sector, but it's called an EBR, Extended Boot Record. Uh, it does not have any, any boot code or something, but it does have the same space as an NBR has uh, for the tables. So there's another <coughs> set of four entries there available to define uh, partitions. But for the logicals, only the first two are used, where the first uh, slot will uh, define the uh, actual logical partition you're looking at, and the next slot will uh, <coughs> point to the next area, so that it's <coughs> the free space, and it, it's forming sort of a linked list of logical partitions. And the last one uh, will only have the, the logical partition defined, and the link to the next one will be zero. <coughs> OS2 LVM, the logical volume manager. It was introduced with version <coughs> 4.5, I think, or with the original warp server. Yeah. 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 Uh, and what it does is, uh, since the NBR system lacks space to put extra information in there, uh, and IBM wanted to have uh, 
uh, information like uh, fixed drive loader assignments and stuff like that for participants. Uh, they had to invent something for that. And what they chose is to uh, to add mm -hmm. special sectors to uh, to the MBR scheme to complement that. And what they did is, uh, for the sectors that existed, like the MBR and the EBR, which are in the very first sector of the track on the, on the disk, they put a, an extra information sector in the last uh, sector of the same track with the extra information. Uh, and in there they put uh, things like volume names, uh, partition names, and drive numbers. And the the difference between volumes and partitions for LVM is that uh, the volume is, uh, is, is, is a single file system, has a single drive letter, but it can consist uh, of more than one partition. So you could have uh, two or three disks, have a partition in each of them, and create a single volume from those partitions. So you could, you could create a very large volume from the smaller uh, disks. For uh, to do that, you'd use uh, the LVM type uh, 35 partitions, and uh, the, actually the only file system that really supports that is uh, JFS. But LVM uh, does support it generically, but uh, most other file systems are not uh, able to handle that. Question. <coughs> yes. There are possibly the four primaries. Yeah. Uh, one of the primaries could be a logical volume inside of which you can have multiple... No, not a logical volume, no. uh, a logical partition. Yeah, it has to be an extended uh, partition. Sorry? Huh? You've got four primaries, and yes. one of those primaries can be subdivided. And the subdivisions are called logical partitions. Yes. Mm -hmm. LVM is a different concept. What that does is for all partitions, either primary or logical, it will add some more information ah. to describe the partition, basically. Mm. Okay. So you could have two different disks that you put in one volume and, and see them as one drive letter. You yeah, that's two physical disks. Well, that, that's one of the things you can do. It, it's right. hardly ever used anymore, but that, that's a possibility. That's one of the things they wanted to do, especially for uh, things like servers where they could have a large data volume that actually consisted of maybe uh, five or ten uh, physical disks and just put them in a single data volume with a single drive letter to be used and to be being served over the network. But on, on the workstations it, it's not very uh, useful to have that capability. Can the additional LVM information interfere with other OS's like Linux or Windows or, um, or how does that work? No. Not really. It's more the other way around. The <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are lots of other operating systems that try to use that same sector for different things. So you, you, by installing Linux, for instance, it's very easy to lose your LVM information. Uh -huh. Or even worse, what sometimes happens is if you use Linux uh, partitioning tools, they'll often very slightly move partitions or move the starting sector up a little bit to align uh, stuff the way they like it, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it out of sync with OS2 LVM yeah. and then you don't see it in OS2 anymore. Right? It's usually not very difficult to fix, but uh, you've got to be aware of it. So what sometimes happens if you've got a system with Windows and OS2 on it, for instance, and you add Linux, in 9 out of 10 cases you, you'll end up with the system booting Linux and, and the rest being invisible at that point. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, the first one is uh, dynamic expansion. Uh, I think it works. Uh, Actually, JFS and LVM was a concept uh, by IBM that was never really matured, never completed the way they, they uh, intended it to, because the, originally the intention was to have resizable stuff, and uh, the only thing they actually implemented was that if you had a, uh, a volume, you had a JFS volume, and it, uh, it was nearly full, then you were able to uh, create a second partition on the same disk or another disk, and add it to that volume. That's 
Uh, that's the extent of this uh, driver, by the way, that, that does that booting. So if you define it in LVM, you have to reboot, and then it will uh, add that space to the volume. Drive letter assignments is, is uh, very useful because you can use a fixed drive letter uh, for your data, for instance. Uh, just choose a letter and it will not change if you plug in uh, external disk or, or you can have external disk like backup disk and, and have them uh, have the letter uh, W or whatever you want. Uh, and, and be sure that they always get that letter if you plug it in, at least if you plug it into OSD. Yeah. yeah. If you have uh, a an LVM partition and you clone it. Is so that going to carry? If you have an LVM partition and you clone it, is yeah. it going to carry that letter across? Uh, that depends how you clone it. If you only clone the partition, it doesn't. Because the the way it works, uh, if you got a complete partition and you, then you got an uh, EBR sector, you mm -hmm. got some empty space, then you got the LVM sector. Then you got the actual partition contents. It starts with a partition boot record. And if you clone the partition, well, that's the part that's being cloned. So the stuff before it, including LVM and the EBR sector, is not being cloned. Because that's considered you know, to be part of the partitioning system and not of the partition itself. And that's how DFC normally does it. <coughs> Sorry? That's how DFC normally does it, is it? Uh, well, if you do a partition to partition cloning, yeah. Because then what you what you do is uh, you define a new partition, including new LVM information, and then you just clone the contents from one area <coughs> to the new one. And if you use the copy functionality, which is in the menu, it's sort of a combined function. What it will do is it will look at the old partition and partitioning information and create a new partition, including LVM information in the new spot, and then copy it over. So it's, it's just a combination of two things that you would normally do manually. Yes. So using the copy function uh, might be a more successful way to move a, uh, let's say, a Windows partition from one uh, hard drive to another hard drive rather than cloning. That might be safer. Um, well, that depends. First, Windows doesn't use LVM at yeah. all, so, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's just the uh, it's just the partitioning thing. Uh, the only thing. The only extra thing that the copy does for you is that it will create a partition for you with the same size as the original. It doesn't add very much. If you had Windows on a, a master boot record hard drive or yeah. SSD drive, uh -huh. then you'd have that. You bring, bring that across that way. Then copying would be I, because I tried. I tried cloning it and I had trouble. Um, well, the, copy the, may the work problem for usually is not in, in the copying or in the cloning. The problem the is that it, if you if you put it somewhere else. Uh, it's going to be enumerated or ordered differently at boot time. So the extra information that Windows keeps in its uh, boot.ini file or in its binary uh, DCB or whatever thing it's called these days it's BCD, uh, yeah. will be out of sync. So okay. you need something like BCD edit or uh, another yeah. tool uh, to make sure that the information matches your new uh, location again. Okay. And that's, the, Windows that's BCD, the, the Windows BCD boot code uses the serial number on the drive to create a UUID so it's unique to that drive. So if you don't redo the boot code at the beginning, Windows won't boot if you change it to another drive anymore. So you have to use what he said, some kind of uh, boot editor for Windows to fix the boot code. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, I'm gonna have to struggle struggle through it. Learn to have it. <coughs> if, yeah. if you if you boot off the uh, if you boot off Windows installation media you got a recovery option or something or, or repair or whatever. And one of those options is to, to edit the uh, uh, BCD database. Okay. okay. So that's actually, the, there are some tools, two or three tools, like repair, I'm not sure what the BCD edit, and there's another one. That yeah, you can use. Bootfix. There's one called Bootfix that's in the yeah. uh, Windows command prompt and for the system we'll administration. We'll try to find active or, or bootable Windows partitions and make sure those are being booted by the. By the could be, that could be on the Windows repair test yet. This, this. Uh, yeah, or the installation media. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're going to create separate. Yeah, I, I tried that. Mm -hmm. If you were cloning the LVM partitions and you were uh, using some other software and you had it clone it in raw mode so it did every single sector, wouldn't it also get the LVM information? It wouldn't skip it yeah, then? If you do a, a full disk clone, then everything right. is included. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. 
last one is uh, there's some cooperation between LVM and JFS uh, in, in older operating, uh, older file systems, I should say. Uh, there was some, some kind of uh, bad sector handling where the, uh, for instance, in a FAT file system, you could mark certain uh, clusters as being bad, bad clusters. Uh, in NTFS, there is a provision for it. In HPFS, there is something for it that it can mark bad sectors, so they're not being reused. Uh, and in uh, LVM and JFS, IBM decided to put most of the logic uh, not into the file system code, but in the partitioning part, so in LVM, logical volume manager. So there's some interaction <coughs> between JFS and, uh, and LVM to handle that. Um, and actually what, what's happening is that uh, the file system code will, uh, when it detects bad sectors on writing usually, it will record those uh, and put them in an internal list of bad, uh, bad areas, bad sectors. Uh, and on each <coughs> reboot, when the IFS is being loaded and initialized, it will transfer that information and put it into LVM, a clearing zone list. So in the end, it's LVM that, that, that is maintaining the, the bad sector uh, stuff. Uh, and JFS feeding it that information on the fly. Uh, on the other hand, doing bad sector and bad cluster uh, detection in the file system on the file system level is less and less useful because actually most artists these days do it internally uh, and you hardly ever see real bad sectors on the operating system level. Uh, if you do, then the disk is, is uh, on the way out anyway, so you better replace it. Because uh, all, uh, disks usually have a percentage of 5 to 10 percent of uh, spare sectors that are dynamically being replaced if the, if the internal firmware in the disk uh, detects bad, uh, bad spots. Uh, and when that, when that few percentage of, uh, of spare sectors is exhausted, uh, then your disk is really dying. So once the operating system or file system sees bad sectors, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, something about what it looks like. Uh, again, you see the disk here, uh, so-called compatibility volume. Compatibility volume is, is what used to be the classic thing, like an HPFS or a FAT partition. Uh, and the only thing that happens is that uh, here you've got the partition, with this own partition boot sector and then whatever data there would be. Uh, the EBR was always there, that's the, uh, the sector where the partition table is located, uh, and then at the end of that first uh, track, just before the partition boot sector, there will be an extra <coughs> sector called the drive letter assignment table, the LAT, uh, which has the extra LVM information. And on typical uh, geometries used, so that the CSS addressing stuff, uh, the EBR would be at, at sector zero of the partition, and the uh, LVM sector would be at uh, hexadecimal 3E because the usual geometry used uh, 63 uh, sectors per track which translates to uh, 3E in hexadecimal. Uh, that's not that important. Uh, if you've got a more complicated one like JFS that needs even more information like the bad sector uh, information that I talked about. Uh, then you've got the same layout at the beginning, but the actual data partition itself also has a reserved area at the end. Uh, it's called the uh, signature area. And it, uh, one thing it contains is uh, the PBR, the bad block relocation table. Uh, and there's some more stuff in there. Actually, it's a, it's a flexible system where they could add more and more data uh, based on, on what is needed. But at the moment, only two or three things are used, and the most important one is that the bad block uh, um, And you'll see this extra LVM information being used on, on type 35 partitions only, so the classical JFS type partition. On our modern systems like ArcOS, we usually have the bootable JFS, uh, and that's often installed in a type 7. 
it has to be if it is bootable, but it doesn't really have to be if it's just a data partition. You could put that in the type 35 as well. But there's no real benefit to using the type 35 anymore. Apart from the fact that if you do have type 35 and you, for some reason, you lose the information at the start, it could still be recovered from the information in the end because there's a lot of duplication there. So if the, if the first track would be overwritten, then and you would create a partition new, then DFC would recover the information from the signature area and, and rebuild the uh, LVM, so you'd have the original uh, volume names, drive letters and stuff like that. But that's a very slight advantage. I don't really use Type 35 anymore. <coughs> okay, let's not get into too much detail here. Uh, there's information like extra naming and drive letters. <coughs> and lots of binary stuff as well to keep stuff in the sync. Um, oh yeah, one, one other important uh, thing that's in that uh, signature area apart from the bad, collector, uh, bad sector relocation stuff is uh, the information on uh, multiple partition volume volumes. So if there's uh, uh, more than one uh, partition in a volume, then each of those partitions will have uh, a list of all the partitions that belong to the same volume. Uh, and that is being used to create uh, what I call a fake EVR, so there will be uh, a fake partition table that describes the volume of the complete size that's actually built up from uh, the separate partitions. That's to make it easier for the lower level stuff to uh, interpret it. So it's LVM is, is more or less faking or constructing a single area to be seen by the operating system. And the information to do that is also in the signature. Actually, what this uh, slide tells. <coughs> Another overview of how it would look like on a disk with uh, two partitions, with uh, one compatibility volume and one LVM volume. So the, the compatibility one has. Uh, it's information in the uh, LVM info sector. Uh, for primary partitions, all the LVM information will be in a single uh, sector because there's only one related sector for every sector that defines a partition table. So for the MBR, there's one LVM sector and it can contain information for up to four partitions, just like the MBR defines four partitions. And for each logical partition there will be another LVM sector which we'll see in the next slide I think. And if you got a primary with uh, type 35 then there will be the extra information in the partition data itself at the end. And this is if you have a logical. Again the, the first track will have the MBR at the start and it will have the LVM sector at the end of the first track. Then there's the primaries with a signature area if it's a time 35. And then if you have logicals, each of those will have its EBR defining that partition, so the partition table, <coughs> and it will have its associated LVM uh, sector, the DLAT. And again, if the logical is a type 35, it will have the signature area at the end of the data area. Uh, I'm not sure if you need to get to go very deep into this. You sometimes see warnings in, in DFC and, and maybe other partitioning tools about the geometry not being correct or incorrect placement of uh, the start of the partition, alignment issues, stuff like that. And it all has, all has to do with those rules of uh, aligning partitions, so starting it on the first sector of the, f of the first track or whatever. You can read it back that uh, all these presentations are online as well on my website, by the way. So if you really need to know the details, you can find them. 
medical questions you can always use them. Uh, oh, the, the, one of the reasons that CSS is not really widely used anymore is that it has lots of limitations in sizing because it was uh, defined somewhere in the, the 70s, I think. So uh, that was the time that we had uh, something like uh, 10 or 20 uh, megabyte disks, not gigabyte, megabyte. Uh, and the, the size of the fields that were selected uh, pose a lot of restrictions on uh, sizes. So here. So there used to be uh, things like uh, the, the eight uh, the eight gigabyte limit, and then there was the thirty two gigabyte limit, and uh, lots of biases implemented, workarounds, and then, uh, lots of complications. Most of that is in the past. If you reach those limits, uh, the CSS fields cannot hold the, the complete values of what you want to state. So if you want to say, okay, this petition goes up to cylinder uh, 80,000, 80,000 doesn't fit in the field, so you have to put something in there. Well, some tools put zero in there, some, some tools put all, all ones in there, and some tools uh, truncate the value or, or do it mono low, whatever. So there are different standards to doing things, and some tools uh, are very critical about it. So they really uh, want to see their own standard of uh, putting dummy values in there or the, or the complaint. Okay, GPT. Since the MBR has uh, limitations in size, it can only register uh, or record 32-bit sector numbers and that imposes a limit of uh, 2 terabyte. Uh, a new system was uh, developed by Intel mainly in, in <coughs> as, as part of the UEFE uh, standard. <coughs> it's called the GUI ID partition table. And it's a, it's a generic uh, partitioning style using more than one sector at the start of the disk. Uh, with uh, more space for uh, extra information, like longer names, uh, like uh, uh, unique IDs, GUI IDs, so partitions can be uniquely uh, identified. Uh, and more importantly, all the sector numbers there are 64-bit, so it, it's basically uh, no real limitation on uh, disk size. Um, the way to make those GPT disks uh, more or less compatible with MBR systems and MBR biases is that they still have an MBR sector, but it defines a single partition spanning the whole disk. <coughs> and if it doesn't fit because MBR is, is uh, limited to two terabyte, uh, it will be uh, a two terabyte partition being defined there. And it's called the GPT guard partition. Uh, and it's intended to, uh, to force older partitioning tools, MBR partitioning tools, to see the disk as being in use uh, because they see an unknown type partition, the MBR guard partition. Uh, uh, and they'll ignore the actual GPT information that's behind it because they don't know about it. Uh, but that is to, uh, to avoid uh, all the tools uh, destroying disks too easily. Uh, because they'll just say, okay, there's something on there, but they don't know what. Um, if you use DFC to look at disks, then the default will be that if it, if it senses that there is a GPT guard partition, it will not display the MBR table as such, but it will look further into the GPT tables and use that information to show the partition layout. Uh, but you can switch it off. There's a menu setting somewhere that says something like uh, Auto GPT, which is on the default. If you switch that to off, then in instead of showing the GPT partitions that are actually there, it will show the guard partition. Yes? What does GUID mean? Sorry? What does GUID mean? Uh, G uh, generic Universal ID, I think, something like that. Oh. Or it, it, it's uh, good. It's uh, basically UUID. Uh, okay, you generated uh, something Universal yeah, Identifier. It comes from the Unix and Linux. Unique uh, identifier. It's a 16-byte value, 
and it's uh, well, guaranteed to be unique. It's, it's, it's automatically generated because it, it's uh, so many bits. It's, uh, and it's also uh, when used in GPT and in, in a lot of other things, there are a lot of reserved ranges that are claimed by uh, different manufacturers like Apple has a range and, and Intel has a range and stuff like that. So that's the way they keep it uh, unique. Globally unique identifier. Yeah, globally. Globally. Yeah. Yeah. Globally. Uh, like some some databases, I believe Oracle database will use it as a row ID sort of thing. It's just yeah, yeah. Um, highly unlikely to be duplicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and they use the same thing uh, to identify partitions, but also disks and uh, even the partition types in the uh, GPT are the, are UUID type uh, values. They also have reserved values, like there's a type for Microsoft data, which is usually is NTFS. There, there are types for Linux, and there are types for other, like a GPT system partition. Okay, okay the GPT, uh, apart from that MBR that is still there, and that defines the guard partition, uh, well, that will be followed by a GPT header, which is also a single sector, uh, and that defines the size of the partition table array, and that can be uh, of an arbitrary size, and that was just then uh, recorded in the header. Uh, in practice, I think it is something like uh, sure, maybe something like 64, maybe 128. I think. I think the default is 128. Uh, partition table entries in the table. Um, another thing that GPT adds is a sort of a redundancy. It will uh, repeat the same information, the header and the table, in, in the reverse order at the end of the disk. So the very last sector of the disk will have a copy of the GPT header, and just before that there will be a copy of that uh, partition table array. So this is what a GPT partition disk will look like. There's the MBR, which defines the GPT guard. Then there's the header and the main uh, PTA. Uh, and at the end of the disk, there's the ultimate one. And actually, those two also point to each other. So the, the main header will have the sector address of where the ultimate header, header is, and vice versa. Another thing is that uh, GPT partitions are usually aligned uh, at uh, multiples of uh, uh, one megabyte. It's not really necessary, but it's sort of convention. Uh, that means that usually if you look at the sizes of GPT things, that it will be exact multiples of uh, megabytes. It also means that the first partition, because the GPT tables are at the start, the first partition will start at, at uh, one megabyte into the disk, and there's some a new space between them. <coughs> okay, that's about partition. Questions? Uh, I guess I had never heard of DFC. Is that a partition software in lieu of LVM on? on yes, it is. <coughs> yeah, third-party software. Yeah, is it a native uh, OS2 application? It's also a native OS2 application, but it's also native Windows, also native Linux, also native ah, Mac OS, okay. and native DOS. Yes. <coughs> Actually, the presentations are a bit backwards now. So you can boot on any system just about and create. Uh, you well, drive. Yeah, there's, there's a version for uh, many operating systems. Okay. And there's also <coughs> bootable ones. Actually, I, I, uh, I have one of the your uh, uh, sticks. Can you plug it in and actually show? Because there's an important difference. You can boot it to DOS or you can boot it to Linux, and they behave differently. Yeah. If you could demonstrate that, it might be. I mean, I wasted hours on that. Yeah, you can. I, I can. <laughs> 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 I got one of those as well. Actually, this, this, this is a newer one. 
Yeah, okay. Um, if this, you can show that, that, that the, the one that Jeffrey is talking about oh, is, this the is the older, this is the older FD, type this is the first uh, first USB yeah. stick that I used to make available, mm -hmm. and it has a, a copy of the DOS version of DFC, which works on many uh, PCs, and it also has uh, some code to start the Linux version. I have to copy the Linux version <coughs> manually because it's very large. I carry around with me all the time. Save my bacon many times. Yeah, <laughs> but there's there's a newer stick that's even more useful, I think, and it's called uh, the DFS Puppy stick. It's, it's a very small Linux distribution, Puppy Linux, uh, and I integrated uh, the Linux version of DFC into that. And actually, there's uh, there are menu items in DFC now that allow you to create such a stick very easily. So uh, it will download uh, an image from my website and write that to a USB stick and that will make it a bootable uh, DFS puppy stick. So it boots right up into uh, uh, Linux with DFC. I can probably demo that uh, later on or tomorrow. Um, and those sticks you can make yourself. If you've got the sticks you can also order them uh, in the web shop, in the Minsys web shop place. Uh, or you can buy one from me. I bought 10 or 15 brought with me. So uh, those are 64 gigabyte sticks where PFC is already on, on there. Uh, and there's lots of space uh, to store log files or store small image files or whatever. <coughs> okay, then we should have another one on file systems, which I will go over fairly quickly. Partitioning systems. Uh, each of those partitions uh, should contain files and directories, of course. So, to do that, you need a file system which will structure that, that uh, <coughs> disk space uh, into something that is usable by the operating system. And the thing uh, that does that is called a file system, and it has associated file system drivers in the operating system uh, that know about the structure and know how to find files and directories and whatever other information. Some of those are uh, things like the FAT file system, file allocation table. It's very old. It's developed somewhere in the 70s, I think, based on even older stuff. Uh, it's a very simple system with uh, uh, a file allocation table where there's an uh, administration of uh, which uh, sectors or clusters are in use and uh, a simple directory uh, structure. That, that points from file names to the first uh, sector or cluster for the file. This HPFS, the uh, high performance file system that was developed for OS2, uh, which uh, was intended to take away a lot of the limits of the FAT file system and, and allow higher speed in reading. NTFS, this is the native file system of uh, Windows, starting from Windows NT or something. New technology file system, that's what, it's, uh, what the name stands for. We've got the JFS for OS2, the journal file system, originally uh, originating on the RS6000 by IBM and imported to OS2. Uh, and at the moment, probably the most used file system on OS2 besides HPFS. There's a lot of advantages. Unfortunately, unfortunately the uh, development of JFS stopped just before it really matured, so some of the functionality is not, not really there yet, and some of the reliability is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's still some problems in the check disk, that it's still possible that you get disk corruption that is not recoverable by using check disk. Uh, so, uh, it's a lot better than HPFS in many aspects, but it's not ideal. Okay, then you got the external file systems, EXT, 2, 3, and 4, that are used for Linux, got the Ryzen file system. 
there's more, the presentation is a couple of years old, it should have more. There's HFS for macOS, there's uh, APFS, got the B3FS for Linux these days. There's more and more. XFS, what's the stuff? Not PFS. PFAS and stuff. Okay, well, this is just summarizing it a little bit. <coughs> On the FAT file systems, there's a few variants. I think the classic FAT, <coughs> which is a 12 bit or a 16 bit uh, uh, file system administration. But there's also FAT32, which extended that uh, administration internally to 32 bit uh, cluster numbers, allowing larger sizes and, and better performance and stuff like that. Also, allowing uh, things like long file names by having special directory entry uh, coding. Is there uh, another FAT file system now? Sir? Is there another FAT file system now? XFAT, yeah, but it's not really the same. Yeah, there's also th something called FIFAT, which is uh, actually the old 16-bit file system with the uh, long file name uh, hack implemented. So that it allows long file names inside the 16-bit file system. I think that was used by Windows 95 and stuff like that. And there was also a <coughs> FIFAT drive for OS2, I think. Um, and then, uh, since a couple of years, there's a new one called EXFAT by Microsoft again, of course. Uh, and that is designed specifically to uh, overcome limitations in FAT32, in uh, disk sizes, but also in performance. It's optimized for speed for streaming media, so to, to store large uh, photo files or video files. So it's optimized for sequential reading, fast reading and fast writing. And it's a combination of having a, a, the classic uh, FAT file system, FAT uh, tables actually, uh, combined with uh, some uh, techniques also using NTFS and JFS. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. And XFAT, so XFAT doesn't have the 4 gig file size limitation either. No, yeah, it allows 64 bit uh, real huge files. Uh, and well, and also recently, Microsoft also recently. REFS. Sorry? REFS. REFS, yeah. Microsoft has now got REFS. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, the real time one. Yeah, yeah it's a. Uh, for the uh, uh, stuff. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, yeah, I know there's some variant of the EXFED. That's right. I didn't know about that one. One thing that is uh, sort of pushing uh, the use <coughs> of the EXFED is that the consortium that manages uh, SD cards that are used for photo storage. Well, uh, made the EXFAT file system mandatory for any device over 64 gigabytes. <coughs> so, and the other thing is that the code uh, and the layout of EXFAT is, is proprietary yep. by Microsoft. So, they, and they, of course, they, they license some of the, like Apple or whatever. There's a Linux driver. Mm -hmm. So, you legally uh, can't support EXFAT? Well, officially no, not, but, <laughs> there's, <laughs> yeah. but there's a file system body in DFC that's called EFAT, and it looks very much like that. Okay, let's skip that. That's all right. Okay, what does a file system do, or what does it record? There's usually some generic stuff like uh, uh, volume information, naming, uh, boot sector code probably to start an operating system, special files like uh, OS2 boot or whatever. Then there will be information to find files and directories stuff. Uh, and it comes in lots of different forms de depending on the file system you have. It can be uh, FAT tables, it can be file notes, inodes, MFT records for, for uh, NTFS called master file table or something. Uh, and that usually implements uh, a tree hierarchy because th that's usually what the user sees. They see uh, a root directory with subdirectories with files and or more subdirectories. Whatever. It's a tree structure, and that you need some mechanism to implement that. The, the, actually, the the first FAT implementations did not even implement uh, subdirectories, so they just had a single list of uh, of files. <coughs> and at some point, they implemented extra information to allow 
subdivide and get it to directories. Just like the, the Unix and Linux file systems already could. Uh, then there will be some stuff about uh, managing uh, free space versus used uh, space, and that can be in the form of allocation tables like the FOT. The, the FOT is sort of a mixed thing, it, it, it does two things at the same time. It's, it's, it's advantage in space and ease of use, but it's also a disadvantage because um, if the information gets garbage, uh, gets damaged, then it's uh, also harder to recover because there's less redundancy. Uh, because the FAT table both uh, uh, describes where a file is supposed to be, because it, uh, the directories simply point to the first sector of a file, the first cluster actually. Uh, and then uh, using the table you can see where the next one will be. So if, if that table gets damaged, <coughs> then you don't know where to find uh, the rest of your file. And the other thing that uh, records is that uh, which clusters or sectors are still free to be used. So, uh, we'll see some of that uh, structures later on. So what the, the, the FAT file system actually combines is those last two things into a, sing, a single table. Well, most file systems have separate things for that. They have a, uh, an allocation list uh, for a file or a directory, and they have a separate uh, free space list or a map uh, to record which sectors are in use and which are not. <coughs> okay, this is about the FAT file system. I think I mentioned something. It came from earlier stuff from CPM. Back in the early 70s, I think, late 60s, uh, and it was actually designed for this cat. So really small stuff. I'm talking about uh, megabytes. The support for the FAT file system is actually in the kernel in OS2 uh, for the FAT16, that is, and FAT12 for the FAT32. There's the FAT32 driver. OS2 uh, uses the IFS mechanism install file system to add support for other file systems including FAT32 and also for SPFS and JFS. Uh, even for other things like networking and uh, like uh, NDFS, uh, NetPrime are all implemented uh, by extending the kernel. Okay. <coughs> What does a FAT file system look like? There is a boot record, like in almost every file system. There's uh, There are two FAT areas, which are simply duplicates from each other. And what will happen is, the, the, the idea about this is that there's redundancy, so if one of the FAT areas is damaged, you can, can copy it back from the other one. In practice, that's almost never useful, because whenever an update is being made to the file system, it's immediately copied to the second one. So if there's damage in the fat area, the second one will probably be damaged too. So how does it know it's damaged? I've had it work one time and fixed the disk. <laughs> I've had it work one time and fixed the disk. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. well, anyway. One time. Yeah. Out of the 50 times I've tried. <laughs> there are some functions in DFC to copy, well, to, to save those areas to an image file or to copy one to the other. So you, you can, you can uh, fix errors if there are. But as I said, usually they're both corrupt. So. Uh, then after that, in the FAT 12 and 16 volumes, there will be a, a fixed area for the root directory. Uh, and then there will be a data area. And the data area is, is uh, <coughs> are data sectors, or actually clusters. Clusters in the FAT file system, and also in NTFS and some other operating systems, are simply a collection of uh, a few sectors, uh, making it uh, easier to uh, use larger portions of the disk uh, with less administration. So each cluster could be uh, 8 or 32 or 64 sectors. Uh, so it makes it easier to administer uh, the data. Uh, because the root directory is a fixed area here, it's also fixed in size. So if you format a FAT partition, uh, you're limited to maybe 128 or 256 entries 
uh, and it's actually on the diskette it's fairly easy if you just copy a lot of small files so at a certain point the root directory will be full the, the directory is, uh, the, the diskette is maybe only 30 percent filled but still you cannot put anything else on there because the, the directory is full and it's using the allocation table that's where the name comes from the fat allocation table uh, and that has for every cluster on the file system it has a single slot 12 bits 16 bits or 32 bits depending on, on your fat type uh, and it can have several values like not in use zero or a special value that uh, says that it's a bad cluster uh, another special value that tells you that this is the last cluster in, in a chain and all the other values are pointing so if, if uh, File is taking up cluster one and two, then the directory entry will point to cluster one, and the cluster one value will point to cluster two. This is just, just an extra one. Uh, but there can be holes in it, so it will be linked list until uh, the last cluster, which will have the special and the file value. This is what it looks like then. So you got a directory somewhere, it can be the root directory or a subdirectory. And there's a file name in there, and there's a, a value there for the first cluster. And that first cluster will then either be in the file if it's a small file, or it will point to the next cluster. Questions? So for instance, uh, um, this would be a small file goes directly to end of file, this is also a small file. This is two clusters in uh, 31 and 32. And this will have uh, more than, it will have 43 and 44 next to each other, and then there's a, uh, a jump to 15. <laughs> Just showing fragmented files, and that's the other clusters it's linking to. Yeah, I have to think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, never mind. Anyway, the, what the file allocation is in, in the table is, is a linked list of uh, clusters that are being used until you reach uh, the file. I'm just puzzled by the 44 goes to 15. I have to think about it's that. Probably part of the it's probably part of the way to speak 15 <laughs> is free yeah. at some point from something else. Because that's mm -hmm. how it would work. Oh, yeah. If it would just use the next, the next one on the available yeah. list, which could be earlier than that one, assuming a file it couldn't read. Oh yeah, of course that, that's what it is. <coughs> this one's pointed to forty-three, and forty-four, which is here, points to fifteen, which goes there. Fifteen points to sixteen, which is then to file. Yeah. <coughs> it's been a couple of years, so that we, that's <coughs> okay. Fat thirty-two, uh, basically the same, but it adds a few uh, things. Uh, the standard fat thing has a eight point three limit, so there's eight characters for the base name and there's three characters for the file extension. Uh, and, and the dot really is not there in the directory entry, it's simulated by the uh, file system driver. Uh, and there's a byte for attributes, like root only system hidden, stuff like that. There's some, some bytes for date and time information. And there's uh, two bytes for the cluster number, <coughs> that points to that first cluster of the file. Uh, and in FAT32, uh, two other bytes are used to make a 32-bit file. Those two bytes that are being used by FAT32 have been used in the past but for several other things like VFAT and also to, uh, <coughs> to add the uh, usage of extended attributes for OS2. Uh, OS2 has a concept of uh, extended attributes that go beyond the uh, read-only system hidden thing. <coughs> it's uh, something of an arbitrary size, I think actually limited to 64K or something. Uh, to add extra information on files or directories. 
and the way that was uh, recorded on FAT was that there was a single file with a special name, things like EA space data dot something, uh, which is sort of a database really just records of information, and the uh, that file was indexed by the value in the two bytes that were left over or unused. It's called the e EA index. Uh, that was the way it would be able to find the extended attributes for that file. Uh, which is why you sometimes have problems if you mix, uh, if you use a FAT file system with extended attributes and you use it on Linux or on, on, on Windows or whatever. Uh, it, it could corrupt the uh, EA field, uh, making the EAs disappear for OS2. Windows to keep track of it, but of the extended attributes. Cause I know that it uses extended attributes or did until Windows 10, I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Use the extended attributes for printers similar to the way OS 2 does. Windows? Yeah. It holds fat file systems. I'm not sure if I, I don't know what that's what I'm saying. You know what it does in the fat file system. Well, I, I know, I know, the DFS, uh, I know because there was, no, of course, the, the, the uh, joint uh, effort by IBM and, yeah. uh, and Microsoft back then. Uh, if you look at the NTFS file system, it has specific support for OS2 EAs and special fields for them. Because um, they, they originally can install XP or XP Kim, you know, can be put onto a FAT32, mm -hmm. and seeing the printing system uses the extended attributes, I'm guessing it has to handle the yeah. FAT32. Well, on FAT32, the, the, the mechanism for implementing uh, EAs is different because on FAT32, those two bytes that are used on, on the smaller FATs uh, need to be used to, to create 32 bits. For the, for the, so on FAT32, that's a different mechanism. With the uh, uh, shadow file that we use. Okay, uh, almost through. Time. Okay, some problems are mentioned here for OS2. Oh yeah, data is yeah, one of the problems is that each EA, even if it's only uh, 16 bytes or something, it will take up a full cluster, which could be, uh, uh, depending on the type of fat you had, could be 32K or 64K, it wastes a lot of space, the file could be damaged. Okay, FAT32, it's very similar, except that there's a, a redundancy copy of the boot sector. And also the boot record has two sectors, where the second sector has some extra information about uh, the last used cluster or something that makes it faster in uh, allocating uh, free space. Um, then there's the two FAT areas, which now contain 32-bit entries, of course. Uh, and then there's no root directory there. And that's because the root directory in FAT32 is dynamic, it could be relocated. It's also extendable, so it's not limited in size anymore. Uh, and the way to find it is that there are some unused fields in the boot record that are used to point to the location of the root image. Okay, okay enhanced FAT, so that's the EX FAT, separate bitmap. That's what they added to the classic uh, uh, file allocation table. It makes it a lot faster. So as long as files are contiguous, so written in one chunk, uh, it doesn't need to use the FAT. So it just uses the bitmap and then it can read and write much faster. It doesn't have to follow those linked lists uh, in the file tables. And it does not have the short names anymore, so it has a larger uh, Still has 32 <coughs> bytes, slots more or less, but they combine each, each slot uh, as a certain type. And, and some of the slots uh, contain part of the file name, other uh, slots contain uh, attributes and stuff like that. And you just combine uh, as many slots as they need uh, for the file name up to 256 or something. There's also a journal version, and there's also an uh, embedded, embedded version of the same file system. <coughs> different names. Okay, well, it lifted a lot of the limitations of FAT and FAT32. 
the details on what that would Jan, can you just roll back to the last line of your previous slide for a minute? Mandatory on yeah, SD that's, that's what I Yeah, that's what I mentioned, uh, the SD consortium. Uh, so it's 64 gigabyte and larger will be EXPAN. So they won't be readable on the hosted computer. Except if you have DFC, then you can still. What do you mean the vendors are required to install it? Or the hard, the piece of thing won't well accept the, the, the file system? The camera, the camera firmware must be able to read and write uh, EXPAN. Oh, oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm not sure how, how they do that legally. Uh, they probably uh, pay license costs to uh, Microsoft. Uh, that is why I have phones that tell me that it can only handle 32 gig, yeah. but I can stick in 128 gig and, yeah. and yeah. work because of that consortium thing. If it's, yeah, if it's too old. Well, you can still reformat the thing to use uh, FAT32 if you're not using the Microsoft operating system because that will refuse to. A lot of the phones that format the cards in the XT4 too, so. That's because a lot of the phones now will format the card in the XT4. So they're not using FAT once you format it in the phone. The newer ones do my older phones at least. Oh, yeah. It's FAT32 when I format it. Right, right. A little bigger, but the consortium thing made it where they couldn't say that it would handle bigger than the same. Okay. Well, still being called a FAT, it's, it's actually not really compatible with all the stuff, so it's not very easy to, to uh, uh, enhance the FAT32 drive with EXFAT stuff. The differences are bigger between uh, FAT32 and EXFAT than the difference was between FAT16 and FAT32, because actually the whole directory structure and the way it's being handled is, is different. <coughs> Although it's, I, I think the FAT32 driver has EXFAT stuff. They're trying to, the NetLabs guys are trying yeah, to implement exactly. it. I don't know that it's and working. The ROS has a commanded out, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been removed, actually. Yeah. <coughs> mm. Okay, this looks a lot like uh, FAT32. Except the fat area itself is not duplicated anymore because it was not very useful anyway. Uh, and there are some special files at the start, like the bitmap, and there's a special file for uppercasing uh, mm -hmm. and the root directory. Okay, HPFS, I think we're about five o'clock, supposed to be the end, right? Yeah. Okay, and we'll just continue tomorrow and we'll go over things quickly and then move over to uh, describing uh, DFC, the later versions, and uh, demo some of that, and allow for more questions then tomorrow. Okay? Then we'll continue with this uh, stuff tomorrow. HPFS quickly, and TFS a little bit, and then move on to uh, DFC itself. Okay. If anyone's interested, I'll have those sticks with me tomorrow as well. Uh, you can, uh, the 64 gigs sticks uh, and I'll demo booting it. Actually we can do that right now because we have to uh, set this down anyway.